Welcome to the Combat Learning Podcast. I'm your host, Josh Peacock. If you aren't already, please go to combatlearning.com slash newsletter to get subscribed to updates on the podcast and training resources. To say thanks, I'll give you my transfer cheat sheet, a simple list of do's and don'ts for how to design your practice activities for maximum effectiveness. If you've ever wondered if your training methods are going to transfer to competition or self-defense, this cheat sheet is for you. Plus, I'll send you my little ebook, An Introduction to Motor Learning for Martial Artists, to get you up to speed on what we're talking about in the podcast. Go to combatlearning.com slash newsletter to claim that now. Today, I'm joined by Dr. Ian Rinshaw, Associate Professor in Exercise and Nutrition Science at Queensland University of Technology at Brisbane. Professor Rinshaw is a major researcher in the constraints-led approach to motor learning. In fact, you'll see his name on several of the books and studies recommended throughout the Combat Learning Podcast. In this episode, Professor Rinshaw teaches the environment design principles, a set of four considerations that help guide us into creating effective constraints-led training sessions. Those four principles are session intention, constraint to afford, representative learning design, and repetition without repetition. If you've ever struggled to take the broad principles of CLA and create a framework for consistently designing good practices, this is the missing piece for you. So if you're excited to jump in, hit the subscribe button on your podcatcher and enjoy the show. All right. Today on the Combat Learning Podcast, I am really excited. We have uh, Professor Ian Rinshaw. Do you go by Professor Dr. What, uh, how do you go? Um, almost professor. I'm, a, I'm an associate professor, which is, I think, different to what an associate professor means in in the states. But it's just sort of one level below professor. So, in, yeah, in the states we have a full professor, but associate professors um, we call them we we call them professors. That's how we refer uh, okay, them. Yeah. yeah. So now I'm a full time. I've been doing the job for thirty years. Um, so probably reach where I want to get to. <laughs> in terms of uh, oh my. Yeah. So for, for people that probably don't yet understand my excitement, can you kind of go into your academic background and uh, okay. explain to us your academic background and then your, your research focus? Okay. So um, I started... I did a degree in human movement studies, which is probably the equivalent of your kinesiology, mm-hmm. um, in 1981 um, in Leeds, and did three years of that, um, and then went and did a postgrad in teaching at Loughborough University, um, and then taught PE for four years in a school up in the north of England in Middlesbrough, mm-hmm. um, and then was lucky enough to get a job in one of the local universities um basically started off coaching and running the the gym you know doing fitness testing for staff and students um running high performance squads uh, within the university system um so again racket sports Mm -hmm. um but coached my own sport was really cricket which you won't be too familiar with i always say it's like for north americans it's like baseball it's like baseball yeah (laughs) (laughs) with with brains. Brains. <laughs> <laughs> that's I always get a, I always get a funny look when I say that, <laughs> but that's all right. It just gets a bite. It usually gets a bite. Yeah. Um, and then I, I, the sports science degrees were just starting around that time in England, around the mid nineties. Um, and I went and did a master's in uh, coaching at Edinburgh, uh, at Cramond, one day a week for three years basically, um, and then moved on to do my PhD, which was in interceptive actions in, in cricket. Mm-hmm. Um, and started teaching or lecturing in coaching and then sports psychology. And then um, there always my background really was always fascination with skill acquisition, as you'd imagine, being a coach. Uh, and then a colleague left and I was in charge, so I took over the skill acquisition units within the university um and then so that was in middlesbrough and then moved to te- uh, to sheffield for a couple of years um and then moved on to auckland mm-hmm. and ran the coaching 
stream of, of, of the course over there and then finally moved to Brisbane in Australia in 2007. And I've been there ever since. So my my main area of, um, of focus is, as I said, is skill acquisition, um, motor control, motor learning, whatever words you want to use. Mm-hmm. Um, and my research has really been focused on trying to apply the ideas of of a, a particular, I guess, a different way of coaching, a new newish way. Even I keep saying it's new, but it's not that new anymore. But mm. probably new to a lot of people. Um, yeah. Which we call a constraint led approach, um, which is based on a more of an ecological model of of learning, of skill learning, or ecological dynamics. Um, and really started getting into that when I did the masters in in Edinburgh. Mm-hmm. I had to do a thesis, and I started getting into that reading, um, and really got excited by that. Yeah, um, and mainly the work that I try and do is to try and do it mostly in applied areas if we can. Um, so I think people, if you if you sit in a lab and you do tasks that people can't relate to, if you then start working with coaches or practitioners, they they go, yeah, but that's in a lab and that's not our sport so if you can show them how it works in their their sport then you get a lot more buy-in i, I think mm-hmm. um even to the level of you know some of the tasks which are like running up to bowl a ball in cricket is is a similar task the run-up is the same task really as running up to jump in long jumping or in gymnastics to, to go over a box um but people don't see it as like, oh yeah but that's gymnastics or that's yeah. long jump whereas if you go oh well that's creep ah oh, okay it's exactly the same problem but people want to see in you know in their particular area mm-hmm. so i guess over time that's that's where i've done my work um and particularly trying to help create a new way of coaching that meets people's needs more i think mm-hmm. um, rather than this separation of the the practice from the performance um, and this, you know, the 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 skill for form rather than skill for for effect or like for function, I guess is a way of summarising it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So there's brief potted history in my background. Yeah. So you you kind of covered how you got involved with the constraints constraints led led a th- uh, approach. Um, so what what is a constraint? What is it? What does it do? How does it affect? Like, uh, yeah, I mean, the, the the problem is in the word a lot of the time because people see constraint and see a negative. Mm-hmm. Um, so in in this approach, it was it was um, the idea that a constraint is a boundary that shapes the way that you try and solve a problem or achieve it, be a performer skill, and the, those boundaries can be within the individual, which we would all assume, you know, like um, your strength, your height your skill level, your perceptual ability, uh, your confidence, all of those individual factors, um, as well as task constraints. So um, what the rules of your sport are, for example, would shape the way that you then go about it. How long's left in the, in the competition, um, what the score is. All of these are task constraints, factors that impact how you would say fight in a in a combat sport at any one moment in time mm-hmm. and then the environmental factors which are um physical environmental factors so it could be your mat or it could be the the room that you're in uh, or yeah or actually social cultural constraints as well so there might be a way of doing things in combat sports that shapes the way that you're expected to behave and then expected to to um, coach or expected to fight or whatever, mm-hmm. um, certain values perhaps. So those three factors all interact to shape the the behavior or the or the and the emotions and thoughts at, at any one moment in time. And that can be in the moment, but it can, there's also a history behind that. Mm-hmm. The constraints that sh- shape you as a person, you know, like your history of, of movement, your history of injury. Um, your history of you know even what you do for work can impact on the way that you you move or the way that you think and act. So all of those time this this sort of long term ones, but this sort of instant in the moment constraints as well. 
yeah. um, that shape shape you how you how you perform. Excellent. So, at what a this is a point of confusion. Sometimes I hear when when I try to explain this to other people is. Um, is the, would the opponent also count as the environment in, in like a combat sport? <laughs> yeah, that's a really interesting problem to, to try and identify. And we've been struggling with this with some, with, at, the, at the moment because if you went, so Gibson, who developed ecological psychology, mm-hmm. um, the whole idea is that it's the individual environment mutuality that he mm-hmm. focuses on or he mm-hmm. focused upon. Um, and in that environment, he suggests that the people around you are part of that environment. Mm-hmm. However, in a, in Newell's model, in the task, in the constraint level idea, you could say an opponent is a task constraint. Mm. <laughs> so this is, this is where it gets a little bit complicated. Um, and I think in the ways don't, don't get too hung up on defining one or the other. And, mm-hmm. and Newell, um, Newell, when he first came out with the ideas, really described, he was doing it from an experimental perspective. And his version of task constraints was the constraints that you would manipulate in the environment. So anything internal within you was an individual constraint. Anything outside that was an environmental constraint. But the ones that the constraints that you manipulated were special and he called those task constraints. So it, it's not a straightforward answer. <laughs> but I think um, from a perspective of understanding, I, I think it's easier to consider them as a task constraint. But I could argue, you know, I could just make a strong argument that they're environmental constraints as well. But um, whatever, whichever verb one you want to call them, they're obviously significant in shaping your skill yeah. or shaping what you do in any any combat situation mm-hmm. so, it, so it is it is a it is a weird area because i guess you could consider them technically part of the environment from gibson's approach but yeah, their totally. their their movement is constrained by the same task as yours is the same yep. task constraint yeah 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 um I think that one of the key ideas is is with co adaptation, isn't it? Between mm-hmm. that you are a coupled unit, you're a coupled system with you and your opponent, and that we we've done some work around interpersonal distance. You know of how mm-hmm. the positioning of your opponent shapes what you do, and um, and of course the environment, the, the task constraint of fighting in practice leads to different interpersonal distances than if you're fighting in a real competition, yeah, uh, which is, you know, really quite an interesting problem is how do we simulate fighting if we're, you know, we're fighting a colleague or a, you know, somebody who's in our squad where we don't necessarily want to hurt them mm-hmm. or humiliate, well, maybe we do want to humiliate them more. But <laughs> <laughs> sometimes. Or, sometimes, yeah. Um, but yeah, that, I, I found that, fascinating we, we did some work mike maloney was one of my phd students who i don't know whether you've seen his work around thai taekwondo i did i read the i read the paper taekwondo is my sport that's that's yeah. what that's yeah. what i what i've taught so that i did see that i did i discussed that a little bit with um alan dunton out of uh ireland and that right. was i was really thrilled to see that there's actually constraints led research in taekwondo yeah that no, was cool so so mike was lucky enough to work with at the aias the australian institute of sport with the, the combat coaches and groups mm-hmm. um fascinating research around um the difference in the way that they fought when there was a scoreboard uh, mm. there versus when there wasn't which you'll have you'll have read that idea but yeah people didn't know whether they were winning or losing they'd be taking a guess at if mm-hmm. there was no scoreboard there, they'd think they're ahead and they'd be behind, or they think they're behind and they were ahead. And of course, that changed the way they they fought then. Um, so, really highlighting the importance of, of information, of, of contextual information, in shaping mm-hmm. um, what you, you you know the best way you you trying to achieve your goals. Um, it was fascinating, and then, um, but also there was another study where they were 
yeah, the interpersonal distance change. So when you're further apart, obviously the opponent offers you different opportunities. It, it changes the affordance of what's possible if they're further away or if they're closer. Um, and I'd long sort of debating with Mike about this, about whether it's actually worthwhile then if you if you're just fighting when you're just circling each other and you're outside of that what did dominic course call it i can't remember now the sort of the critical zone isn't it where mm -hmm. there's there's med where lot there's lots possible you be you must got to put yourself in danger to be able to then attack as well yep but in practice you don't necessarily want to get hit or you don't want to hit them too much so yeah. you go that little bit further apart. Now, what's what's possible? Well, you know, I can't punch them. Probably, um, I can possibly just, you know, launch a, a very telegraphed attack by kicking them or you know moving in. It yeah. makes it a bit more obvious, I think. Mm -hmm. Which I guess you know the art of deception is is lost. So, but then of course you've got this, you know, the value of of not wanting to get hurt too much perhaps <laughs> or maybe you just have to learn to live with that i don't know yeah i i think there's a as someone who's done taekwondo um or really any combat sport if you can find pockets where you can relieve the um the cardio or the strength hmm. requirements during practice you usually will f you'll find them somewhere like whether it's whether it's in yeah, yeah. submission grappling or it's in kickboxing, if you can yeah. if you can get out a little bit and, and catch your breath before you go back in, people people yeah. like to do that. Yeah, so you, you, maybe it's part of that learning to explore that part. Mm -hmm. <laughs> what is a critical distance? You, yeah, and you'll and, uh, you'll see that in UFC too. You'll see guys that um, they get a little bit too overwhelmed. Sometimes they'll try and play the outside, try and try and yeah. keep a little little distance and dance yeah. around. One of the one of the things that we we regret not doing um, was looking at who dominates the center. Mm -hmm. You know who who spends that time more in the center and makes people run further. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, it's potentially a future study. There, I think is, you know, it, if it is dominating the center that makes a difference and, and tires the opponent out. Um, can we design coaching environments where we reward that? Maybe yeah. we have a circle within the, you know, you, you know, you're trying to get dominance of that circle or something. Ah. You just tape it on the floor. Yeah. Uh, and if you can get in there, then you don't leave it. You know, can I force my way into there? Mm -hmm. And then, I mean, it's like boxing, I guess, isn't it? It's, you, know, you get dominate the center of the ring or. Yeah. Boxing and kickboxing, yeah. that's an established principle. Well, I mean, that's that's yeah. the that's the conventional wisdom. I don't know that there's any research. Yeah, I don't know. I'm, I'm guessing. <laughs> I'm, 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 a, I'm a lover, not a fighter. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm right. actually not. So. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, I remember, you know, like you can see in the boxes when they get tired, they'll go in and just grapple, won't they? And just mm -hmm. try and lean on, on each other to, yeah. to get a rest or whatever. So, yeah. Um, I, I think it's fascinating. It's a, it's a, it, and it's nice th that these studies were done because we get often criticised that this approach only works with team games or individual mm. games. So one of our one of our key goals really is to demonstrate that constraints can apply to absolutely everything. And on the the website that we created, the Constraint Collective, we've we've deliberately started off with interviews with um, with people in. Um, Canoeing, in um, in athletics, and in equestrian is our next one's in equestrian. So we've deliberately gone away from the, the team games to try and sort of show and and, and we got we got a book coming out. We I think it might be out actually on figure skating. Oh wow! An American uh, American coach who introduced who got in touch with Keith Davids and um, we've developed a book out the series on figure skating and hopefully there's one on swimming to come. And then Rob Gray is going to do one on baseball. So that's pretty cool. Excellent. Yeah, I like baseball. Yeah. So um, along those lines, uh, we've kind of touched on what it means to use the constraints that approach kind of broadly by talking about Taekwondo and how yeah. the way you you design the environment affects the way the, that they actually spar or fight. Um, can, can you 
contrast what the typical information processing approaches you've seen, how that okay. differs from, from constraints-led approach? I guess in, in combat sports, um, so Dominic Ortho, I don't know if you've come across his work, was a, he's a judo player. Mm-hmm. Um, and he's a you know, very, very bright boy. Um, and we would, he, he didn't do his, his PhD in, or his master's or his PhD actually in judo, but we'd, we'd have these discussions about what practice looked like. Um, and I guess one of the, the typical things we would do is this, he would talk about was practicing the move in judo. Mm. You know, um, and, and that often involved half throwing somebody. Yeah. Which I always thought was quite funny. So we practiced, <laughs> you know, getting, doing this, doing yeah. this. And then we eventually throw them over, but but the, that meant we decompose the task into mm-hmm. parts. We teach part of it, and then we try and then put the whole back together. But for me, that was significantly problematic. So if somebody wants to throw me over the shoulder, I think I might resist. You know? yeah. <laughs> so therefore, the the way that I'm going to create instability and get them off their feet is going to be different than if they're helping me throw them over. So my, my question there is what use is that? How useful is it to have somebody helping you throw them rather than resisting throwing them, which, you know, w- would require, a, I guess, a whole series of different ways of, of moving them around and creating instability and your footwork would be different and so on and so on. So that would be, a for me, that would be a typical approach from an, if you want to call it an information processing approach where we break these activities down into their component parts. We, we then, we focus on the individual really rather than the whole system and the environment that affects that. Mm-hmm. Um, whereas in a, in a constraint led approach, we, we really want to try and use um, ideas around keeping it as real as you can. It is, if if at all possible, and so we developed, well, we built on the ideas of Brunswick, um, and I guess a lot of the ideas around transfer of, of represented what we Ross Pinder we call representative learning design. Hmm. How and I just sort of coined the phrase. Really, does it look and feel like the real thing? Yeah. So in that in the case of teaching that particular throw, what could I do to help the person learn the whole movement um if somebody is resisting could i simplify the task Uh, and i'm just making this up off the top of my head so you (laughs) you might go no that's rubbish which is fine um but maybe if i'm helping somebody to learn this move to start with i'll give them a a smaller a lighter person to have to throw Mm. to just help them get the feel of that and then Mm -hmm. obviously over time begin to match that more to the people who are in their weight category or belt or whatever it is. Um, So the the idea of representative design gets coaches to think about how does this look and feel like the real thing? And it doesn't mean it has to. So we developed an idea of a dial. So the real thing would be 10 out of 10. Mm -hmm. Um, But I, I've developed a sort of a coding system based around, almost like a traffic light system. If it was red, it was one out of 10 or yeah. two out of 10. And therefore you're completely breaking down the, the perception action couplings. Yeah. Um, um, and if you go in in there, you've got to have a really good reason for doing it. You, you might, but I guess the example from, from baseball would be ridiculous activities like T-ball, you know, where we're learning yeah. to hit a ball off a tee rather than learning to hit a moving ball that's coming towards us. Uh, so I would I would give that a one, you know, and and absolutely pointless in le- really in trying to develop the timing of your swing with a ball right. moving towards you. Um, so there's you know that would be an example. Um, I don't know what it would be in Taekwondo. What would you give a one? Shadow fighting maybe fighting against Casper. Uh, probably a, like a form, like a like a prearranged yeah. mo- uh, set of movements in the air. Which is basically yeah. shadow fighting is kind of that, but it's more you you just create the movements. Yeah. So the, the, usually the you know the intention 
is the most important thing that shapes the way that you move, isn't it? Mm-hmm. So if I'm, if I'm, move, you know, I guess things like fighting against a pad you yeah. know, or yeah. trying to kick a, kick a static bag or something like that yeah. would be an example of breaking it down. You might argue that that is useful. I don't know what you'd give that out of 10. You know, but the, and but guess what we want is to try and move, get the coach to at least think about it mm-hmm. and then see if they could squeeze it a little bit more towards the 10. But understand that five can be fine or six can be fine or whatever, but that you will lose certain information yeah. um, if you're yeah. doing that. Um, it'd be like using a pitching machine in yeah. baseball. You know, there's a, a pitching machines coming at you. So we've got the ball traveling towards us, which is, you know, a good thing. But we're losing all the cues from the pitcher, mm-hmm. you know. And and if we, I don't know what baseball pitching machines whether they actually use a real ball or whether you use a rubber, you know, in cricket we use a ball that's not got all the markings of the seam markings that a ball would have, and that's really useful and important information that helps you work out which way it's going to swerve or swing in the air. Mm. Um, if, if baseball is done with a real ball i guess and we know i think blundell did some work where we know that the seam actually gives you information about which way it's spinning yeah so if there's a ball without a seam then you're losing critical information that will help you inform um so that that, that's sort of approach really We're, we're looking at trying to trying to make the task um not prescribe the solution as much but help them give them a a general intent, we want you to score points by hitting, punching, kicking this area of your body or whatever Mm -hmm. in Taekwondo. But we're not necessarily going to prescribe how to do that. But we're going to invite you to find solutions and find ways that that, um, work for you, I guess. Um, And that would mean adding a lot more variability into practice. Right. So it might might mean fighting people who with different limb lengths or mm-hmm. different heights or different action capabilities in terms of their strengths and weaknesses, um, and then exploring how you would find a way of beating that person. I guess so. Adding a lot more variability into practice rather than mm-hmm. um, for, for different reasons than than the sort of motor programming idea. Of, of that variability there is to you know create parameters where the program can be created into a schema blah 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 whereas ours is all about finding lots of different solutions to solve the problem excellent put simply i guess <laughs> yeah no i think <laughs> that's maybe a, not simply <laughs> that's a good that's a good overview well i the thing with the constraints led approach is that n- no matter how simply you put it um it's just a different way of teach like different way of thinking about yeah. it and yeah. you're you're never going to get past the fact that it's just a different way of thinking about it so people have to have i i know i had to have repetitions of of hearing people talk about it from different perspectives yeah, yeah. in different ways until i really really began to understand it um that's, and it's a really good point so even in learning we need more variability we need to see it from different angles and yeah you do i haven't thought about it like that but that's yeah. it's a really cool idea yeah yeah I have an ed psych background, so <laughs> that's how that applies. That's how constraints led approach applies to that, I guess. <laughs> it, it sort of reminded me of um, when they interview witnesses at, at you know, an, an incident, don't they, with cognitive, mm-hmm. what, what do they call it, cognitive restructuring or whatever, in, in interviews where they get them to tell the story but start at different points each time. Yeah. So that seems to help you create better memories of what's gone on. And, it, it, and if if you're not actually if you're not remembering a real event, it's it um, you will change important um, details that shouldn't change. Like if you're if you're yeah, rec- yeah. if you're recalling, sometimes unimportant details will be you'll change those. But um, big mm. big details, especially details that are related to salience, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, emotional salience. You don't typically well, that, that, change those. That's what that's where my brain just went to. There is in terms of emotion, um, mm-hmm. and and often when you know like, like really important emotion it plays a significant part of of learning, doesn't it? And and when we're emotionally engaged in something, then we we change 
our intentions, we change what we're thinking, um, but we also change the what we see in the world or what we what we're looking for, what we see, but also then the way that we move. So if you're if you're fighting when you're incredibly nervous, you're going to you move differently than if you're, yeah, you know, on top of it and, and thinking. So we we really do need to create emotions. That's part of the representative learning design, yeah. and John Hedrick's work on affective learning design, mm-hmm. where we're trying to create opportunities to experience the emotions that you would get in a fight. Mm-hmm. And of course, because it's dynamic, they're going to change all the way through the fight. Absolutely. Um, and, and by not by osmosis, but by experiencing that, you begin to know yourself better mm-hmm. and, and know then how to, you know, the coach then can help you sort of embrace emotions rather than remove them or, you know, yeah. acknowledge they're there. There's um, energy management is a really big thing in combat. I mean, it's a mm. big thing across sports. Yeah. And uh, your level of um, your level, the, the level of arousal you're at dictates, I think, how much uh, adrenaline you have in your system. And yeah. you, depending on what state your system is in, you are tapping different energy systems. So if you are too, if you are too nervous. Um, to, in a competition, you're going to expend that energy too quickly and then you're not going to be yeah. able to recover. And that's going to create a vicious cycle with your psychological state. Yeah, yeah, completely. So you need to, that comes back to that simulation then, doesn't it? Mm-hmm. Of, Absolutely. Of the of, of a competition. So, you know, I don't know how many times you fight within a day if you get to the final and win it, mm-hmm. but... You've got to be able to manage that process. You, you've got a limited energy resource, I mm-hmm. think, as you're saying. Yeah. So we've got to manage that. And, and it can be really important to understand how much energy you've got left mm-hmm. because that will impact the way that you fight. Yep. You know, I, I can remember playing in a badminton tournament when I was about 16, and I'd only been playing a year. So I'd, first year I played, I got knocked out in round one. The second year, I got to the semi-final of the singles, the, the men's doubles, and the mixed. I was absolutely cooked by the time I got to the semi-final, <laughs> um, and I knew I couldn't beat in the singles. I knew I couldn't beat my opponent, but I thought we but we were playing him in the mixed doubles, and I thought we got a chance of winning that. So my goal in the semi-final was just to try and win the point in as quickly as I could. So I went for shots that were very unlikely to succeed. But I wasn't going to waste any energy on playing long rallies against it because mm. I wanted to save that energy for the for the mixed doubles. And it, it, you know, it, I was right. I, I lost probably just as well, probably a little bit easier than it would have been if I'd have tried to outfox him. But I mm. did have some energy left to go into the semi final against him with his partner, we, which we nearly won. But then he started playing us on his own. So. Right. <laughs> yeah. But, that was that was an e- example of understanding what resources you got, isn't it? That you, when you set an intention, you know. That it's almost like a fuel. I was reading something about intentions the other day. It's like knowing what fuel you've got left in the tank, isn't it? Mm-hmm. And that amount of fuel will determine the way that you, the manner in which you try and achieve your goal. Yeah. Uh, you know, if I if I've got a relatively empty tank i'm going to have to be potentially more conservative to try and get to the end of the the journey especially if i know there's no petrol station halfway along that i can refuel at. yeah um, whereas if my tanks full, i can maybe blast it and you know go a bit quicker or whatever right so it's really quite i think it's quite a nice idea that yeah yeah that's that's a part of the of any combat sport is really just understanding how you're going to manage your uh, your energy levels in the match and what you're going to do to try and manage it between matches. Yeah. Cause sometimes yeah. events aren't, aren't managed very well and you could have two fights really close together and then not fight again for an hour. I mean, it's, yeah. it's, yeah. um, yeah. Absolutely. So we need to simulate that as much as possible, don't we, in our training? Yeah. You know, um, and even the, you know, the length of the bout and the type of bouts that you, you're going to get, I guess. Um, and that I think that this way makes the whole approach a bit more fun because it makes it more creative. Yep. And you can use the constraints idea to start 
building up those environments and yeah. you know simulating the you know if if our opponent is a task constraint is what typically type of opponents could i be faced with you know i guess the the list is infinite but maybe right. there are a number of categories of style of fighter or mm -hmm. size of fighters and then we can start deliberately exposing our our players to those different types of opponents you know um which I don't think we'd necessarily think about our opponents too much. We, we often focus too much on the individual rather than thinking about the whole, the whole environment. I might be wrong. I mean, maybe, maybe combat fighting is different to a lot of other sports in terms of that. Uh, there's aspects. It's all over the place. There's aspects of it that are very, very focused on the individual, and then there's other aspects of like everyone's trying to look for like what are the what is the perfect biomechanics? What's the perfect yeah, yeah. What's the thing that we can do to all of our fighters to make them all perfect fighters? Which is, I think, the wrong approach. But uh, there's there's a lot of people trying to. to I think do that's that. standard in in the traditional approach, isn't it? Mm -hmm. The standard that there is one perfect yeah. model of this is what a particular move looks like, and and if it doesn't look like that, when then we go into a deficit model of coaching. Is <laughs> like here's here's what it's supposed to look like here's what they look like here's all the things that you're doing wrong which yeah. is also a pretty negative way of, co of coaching i think rather than going you know I, and so i always like to ask coaches who are the three best performers you've ever seen and they go da 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 da, da, da. and i said do they all do it in the same way and they go no 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 they're all <laughs> their own unique style. you go yeah. so why are we trying to sort of funnel our our players into this oh because then they're not geniuses, you know, like, oh, man. Not, not, you know, that's the usual excuse, isn't it? They, of course yeah. they can do it that way because they're special. Right. Whereas my fighters aren't special. You're going, well, actually they are. They're all unique. They're all going to mm -hmm. find, you need to help them find their best way by focusing on what they can do, not what they can't do. Um, which is a really interesting discussion to have with coaches a lot of the time. Yeah. But surely we need to tell them what they're doing wrong. <laughs> yeah, that's no, that's uh, that's like the yeah. teachers the teacher expectancy thing. Yeah, absolutely. with the, with the where the way you the way you feel about your students or your learners, it it kind of subconsciously organizes the way that you coach them. And if you feel like they're not special and they're not going to go anywhere, then the way you coach them is going to almost predestined sure that to don't. happen yeah <laughs> <laughs> i've achieved my goal <laughs> yeah exactly i want i want all my students to be losers <laughs> but they look really pretty they look move nicely yeah they look like they lose in competition the but they look good at in uh, yeah, training but good, goodness they look good when they're fighting they never <laughs> win but they look good doing it. <laughs> exactly yeah there's um, a lot of that in sport isn't there that, I yeah think that goes all over the place so many sports there's a, a famous cricketer in Australia, like, like for baseball, you know, how many, how many runs do you score, or you know, what's your average or whatever. But he goes, it's not how, it's how many. Mm -hmm. The only th the only thing that matters is how many runs you score. You know, it doesn't matter how what it looks like. There's, you know, there's no description in the in the newspaper or in the right. scorebook or whatever. So you just see a number at the end of it with your name next to it. Yeah. That's like the the money the money ball concept of absolutely hey, just get the runs. We don't want to look spectacular. No. We don't want to look just win the game, line. will you? Yeah, yeah. Just win, <laughs> win the game. Win the fight. I don't care how you do it. It can be the ugliest fighter in the world, and but yeah, perfect money ball is a really good example of that, isn't mm -hmm. it? It's about it, it, and it comes back to what what your intentions are, mm -hmm. and of course, there's that. The money ball really that social, cultural, historical constraint of what a good pit, you know, a good hitter or a good pitcher is supposed to look like. Whereas, you know, we, we just want to, we want effectiveness mm -hmm. or function rather yeah. than form. Right. So, in your in your constraints letter, a book, you you and your colleagues, you devote an entire chapter to. Um, what you call the environment building principles. We've really, we've touched on two of them pretty good. Yeah. Um, yeah. And this is, the, the way I see this is that this really kind of creates a framework of how to, how to use the combat learning, I'm um, combat learning, <laughs> I'm sorry, the constraints led to see too many CLs. The no, constraints, sorry. the constraints led approach um, in a practical way to, to help design 
your session. So we talked about session intention, which is really, well, we, we've talked about atten- intention in a lot of different senses uh, yeah, or yeah. in different areas. Yeah. But um, can we talk about uh, constraint to afford and repetition yeah. without repetition? So constraint to afford is really um, bringing two ideas together, the idea of constraints and affordances. And, and mm-hmm. affordance is a feature of the environment um, that offers the performer an opportunity or invites them into act in a particular way. So um, I can give an example uh, in, in combat sports, a really tired opponent who's got no energy left offers mm-hmm. an opportunity to kill them off or mm-hmm. <laughs> whatever. <laughs> or, or it might be, you know, somebody with a – and it's all relational, so it's related to what – it offers you as an individual. So, you know, a, a particular fighter, I, I view what they've got, what they offer me in terms of where I'm going to fight them mm-hmm. in relation to my action capabilities and my structure, my anatomical skill set, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. But if somebody else fought them, they'd have to consider them in terms of what it offers them as well. So, they, and you know, an opponent obviously is different. The affordances of what one opponent offers is going to be very specific to that individual. So affordance is relational. And I guess what we want to do is the idea of constraint to afford is that we want to bring in constraints that might invite them, that might exaggerate those affordances if people are not picking them up or not mm-hmm. aware of them. Um, so, um, you know, I, I don't know about stancing in uh, combat sports, how somebody's stance might impact on the way that you would attack them. Yeah, it, open, yeah. opening and closing angles makes yeah. it difficult to access certain targets. Yeah, absolutely. So what, one of the, if, if they're not very good at picking up what the stance offers them, you could constrain the defender, the person that you're fighting, to stand in particular different ways mm. to then invite your player to start picking up that information so like in bas- basketball you know whether you're square on whether you've got one foot in front of the other left foot or right foot in front offers you an opportunity to attack them on the foot that's pointing forward mm-hmm. well if you don't know that we we need to then deliberately manipulate those constraints mm. um it could be that you know they the idea of dominating the middle of the ring as i said we could put a, a space in there that you know, you, you're going to get, rather than win the fight necessarily, I mean, if you can throw them, fine. So you don't want to create it unrealistic. Yeah. But the winner is going to be the one who spends more time in that center area in our game. You know, so that could be our, we want to emphasize trying to stay in the center. So our game could simply, whoever spends the most time in that middle area wins the fight. You know, and you can have two watches on going, dirt, 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 dirt. Um, so as soon as you get in, it comes off. As soon as they go in, it goes up, and so on and so on. Um, but that would be an example of a constraint. So the, the key about constraints is is to actually think about carefully about the constraints you want to add in, mm-hmm. rather than just randomly throwing them in. You, you're trying to bring it in. You're trying to manipulate constraints for a particular reason. Mm-hmm. So maybe you would m- manipulate the the size of the the map or something, you know, you might make smaller map, bigger map, depending on what you wanted to work on mm-hmm. uh, with your with your fighter. Um, and again, that, that would be an affordance, wouldn't it, on a tight area here. This is going to promote more of this type of attacks or this type of defense. Whereas if we go big, you know, if, if, if you know you're going to fight somebody who's a bit of a runner and, you know, keeps moving and just doesn't let you get near them, like, well, we can sort of exaggerate that by affordance by making the map bigger. Um, and then how do I work on, you know, boxing them off and work, moving them into a corner or something like that that mm. they can't get out. So, yeah, the constraint to afford is is sort of a combination of the two ideas. Mm. Um, and that, I think that, that comes from understanding what the affordances are as well. Um, apparently it's a difficult word to get your head around. But um, it's literally, you know, an 
a surface could be an affordance. So different types of surfaces mm-hmm. afford you different ways of fighting. You know, like, mm-hmm. I, I don't know the you know the the map the the density of the mat or mm-hmm. whether you're on a hard wooden floor or on a concrete. I don't know. I don't know where you fight. Hopefully somewhere where it's not going to kill you if you land. <laughs> uh, we, we fight on mats and there is a difference between the mats tend to be thinner for striking combat sports and they tend to be uh, squishier for grappling sports where you have to fall. Right. So that, that yeah. changes the way that you're able to generate force off the ground and agility and things like that. So that, they would be a really good example of Particularly if somebody, um, you know, if you went somewhere and the mat's slightly different, you know, maybe it's older and worn or mm-hmm. it's doesn't quite got as much squish in it. If you went, I don't know, you imagine going overseas and somebody's going to fiddle it a little bit to try and make you so that they're comfortable with their mats, but they're very different to the mats that you've done. Or mm-hmm. I don't know. But yeah. these are the constraints that you can manipulate, aren't they? they you know, if you were being sneaky in an international sport, that's maybe the way people try and use the home advantage. Or, mm-hmm. But also, you know, like I'd imagine fight in a room where the mat goes right to the wall feels very different than if you're in a mat in the middle of a huge hall or something like that. Or right, right. Even the crowds being right on top of you. Mm-hmm. Um, of course, the ref, or is it referee? Or what, what do you have an umpire or a referee? Or? Uh, we have a, re- a referee and judges yeah. on the corner. See, that that's a really important constraint that you can manipulate, isn't it? Is the way that, do you know how this referee is going to referee this fight? Yes. And they've got some preferences, you know, and, and you see people, oh, the ref didn't do this, that, and the other. Okay, well, you should have prepared for that. You know, we can manip- We could actually say, right, we're going to some- spend some time here manipulating the rules. Mm-hmm. This referee is going to interpret it that way or that way. And you- you've got to work out what those rules are as quickly as you can um, and play to that condition. Or you scout the referee in advance. We mm-hmm. know that this ref likes this way or doesn't like that. Um, mm-hmm. So we need to know what the intentions are of the, ref- the referees and what meets their own model of what the fight should be like we, we did that in soccer refereeing is the 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 referee and the players co-created the game that they wanted <laughs> you know, that the referee had their own set of goals of what they were trying to achieve which was mm-hmm. um safety fairness accuracy and entertainment the ref at the highest level the referee saw themselves as part of the entertainment package mm. So their interpretation of different situations changed depending on the context. It was never one correct decision. Right. Uh, so we needed to know what that referee was. But, you know, early on, if they want to kick lumps off each other, the referee is going to have to come in and go really hard. But if they want to play a, a fast, attacking, fair game, then the referee will, you know, support that and allow things to go a little bit more. So they co-create. So the referee is a really important part of that training environment. Oh, oh, don't go in mad. Um, <laughs> really important part of creating that representative training environment. Mm-hmm. So if you don't have a ref, then you're missing key information, aren't you? Yeah, that's absolutely true. Mm-hmm. So what about repetition without repetition? What is, repetition what is this concept? Be- Oh, so often we'll see traditional practice where we repeat the same move over and over again to try and make it perfect. Mm-hmm. So we tend to call that, that to call that repetition after repetition. We just it's like a lot, lot practice mm-hmm. uh, to try and create this perfect model. Whereas the idea of repetition without repetition is that we'll give you a general outcome to try and achieve, but we want to provide as much variation, variability. Sorry, a dog's going crazy. <laughs> That's all right. I think there's somebody down either front or down drive. Um, but it, it's trying to create as much variability as you like. And that can be in the, the, the different fighters, for example, or different environments. It's entirely up to you what you want to manipulate. Mm-hmm. And again, we developed a dial around that. So how much repetition, how much variability do you want to actually create? Um, and for a beginner, you might have a lower level of variability, but for your, your elite performers, you want um, potentially to have 
much more variability in there. And, and it links, of course, to representative design. Is, is, right. You know, what, what would we we'd want to make as look as possible? Can I? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, the joys of, of Zoom calls. Yeah, so you, again, you using your constraint builders where you might have, you know, a particular variable, a particular constraint, you might look for six different variations of that. Yeah. Then you might, you know, you might go, well, I want to work on these two or one, want to work on all six or ten or whatever. Right. But it's, again, it's being deliberate in thinking about what amount of variability you can have in. So one of, one of the things we did with our students last week was give them one minute games left. Um, and it was like a game of end ball, which is sort of a modified game of basketball type mm -hmm. of thing. Um, and it's one minute left. You roll a dice to find out what the scenario is in that one minute. And you could either be leading behind or level in possession or out of possession. And you've got one minute to solve this. Um, and then, once they had a go at that, then they, they had a team meeting to when I cut, but they had a coach. What are we yeah. going to do to do this better or even better next time? And then they'd have another go at it. But you just keep throwing different scenarios. So now they're actually practicing what could happen in a game. Mm -hmm. What are we going to do if we're one nil down with one minute left or whatever? So you can create those scenarios. You could be you could do that beautifully with your fighters. You've got one minute left. Here's the score. You've got to find a way of defending a position or coming back and trying to even it out or win or whatever. Yeah, scoring, yeah. Uh, you score, you've got to score. So that I'd imagine that would be pretty good fun for, for fighters as well and realistic. Yeah. How am I going to manage this? What What is my, you know, what is my, how am I going to try and achieve in this situation? And of course, then that your role as a coach changes. Because you then go, you're working with them to say, okay, how did that work? What were you trying to achieve? What, what could you have done? Like, all right, okay, let's go and have another go at this. Let's, let's see if we can do it better. You know, um, and again, that therefore you, you're making it more representative. Yeah. Of what you're going to need in a fight, but you've got a lot of variability in there, you know, so you can just have all the different scenarios, even against the same opponent or different opponent, you know, so on and so on. Yeah, that that sounds incredibly fun. When you said that, I was like, "Oh man, that would be fun to have." Yeah. Put, put a score on the scoreboard that's just there, yeah. and you either have to maintain the lead or break a tie yeah. or come back yeah. From, yeah. from from lagging. And if you know that you know you can base this on their history of fighting. You right. know, here you were in a situation you were you were up, you were leading. There's a minute left. And you went hell for leather and try to kill him rather than just <laughs> whatever, you know, like, so let's practice that. Let, let's create some real scenarios where, where this is related to what you need and what you've worked on. Yeah. Or if they, you know, if we're building into competitions where they've never done a fight before, okay, let's simulate that. Yeah. Why wouldn't we, why wouldn't we make training much more like the mm -hmm. needs of the competition? Funny bizarre at the time. And I'll tell you what, we they did twelve minutes of work. So we played lots of different games, lots of different scenarios. They were absolutely cooked because <laughs> it was massive, high intensity. Yeah. Uh, the engagement was just full on. You know, the noise level, the interaction. It was just we were just standing back there smiling about what it was the first time we'd really had a go at it with this group. Mm -hmm. And they just bought into it massively. Oh yeah, you know. Um, so you got you got them. You got them engaged. You know, you want to come back then. You don't want. You know, I don't want to be bored doing a drill where I'm kicking a pad. Um, yeah, you know, or whatever. Um, to perfect a kick that where the person the pad doesn't kick me back. You know. Yeah. Yeah. Excellent. How are you on time? Do you have Do you have time? I've got about seven minutes. Yeah. Seven minutes. Uh, well, I was, <laughs> I was going to ask you how ins instruction fits into CLA. That might be too big of a, might well, be too they, big of a I, box. I think, you know, they, they do play a part. Mm -hmm. um, but I think rather than calling them instruction, just think about it as information. Mm -hmm. It's what information are you providing to support the task that you've asked them to do. And what we want that information to do is add value 
or direct mm. search or, or whatever. Mm -hmm. And then any instruction is really important, what instruction you give, because it will shape the way that they then try and achieve the goal to suit, to, to satisfy you. Yeah. And therefore we have to make sure that what you say fits in with what the, the overall goal of the, the task, it comes back to intentions again, making sure your intentions are in line with what their intentions are. Yeah. You know, I want, I want to win this fight and you're going, no, I want you to do this, execute this move perfectly. Now forget that. I want to win. <laughs> you know? <laughs> or, the two might obviously be connected, but um, yeah. think about it in terms of, I just think you practice, think about what you want to say, not to support what you want to do. You know, you, 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 and this is probably the piece that's forgotten about in terms of, of planning practice. It, we practice, we design all the tasks, you know, and all the, all the activities we want, but yeah. we don't often practice what we want them to what we want to say to support that learning. So mm. think about what you what you could see, what you might likely to see, um, and plan some responses. But try and try and invite them to come up with the solutions. Yeah. You know, by asking questions and, and you know, we're not very good at asking questions. We need to get better at that. Right. In terms of but it's purposeful questioning it, of course. And that depends on what you observe. And what you observe depends on your model of skill learning that you are that underpins your design. You know, so if I'm looking on a deficit model to find the perfect technique, that's what I'm going to find. I'm going to see you're doing that wrong. You're doing that wrong, and that's what I then say to them in terms of the feedback, or whatever. Whereas if I'm looking like, how are they going from a positive angle? What are they doing well? Mm -hmm. Then that means that I'm, you know, how are they trying to solve this problem and i think give people credit that they always try and do it to the best of their ability at the, any moment in time it might not be the might not w work but it's going to be the best one they pick people don't choose to do things that are wrong deliberately they yeah. will try and do things that, that they think are going to work and that comes back to that exploration piece doesn't it Allow, allowing exploration and allowing them to find that and often a a failure or a defeat is massive learning. It's a massive learning opportunity. I know now that doesn't work against this particular opponent. I need yeah. to find another one. And obviously learning in performance is you can do that quicker than I can change what's going rather than waiting to the end and going, oh, I've just learned this now. Mm -hmm. So it's learning in performance, I think, is a really important part of that. And that changes the role of instruction, the, the role of what we say, I think, to providing that reflection piece between goes but also letting people have a number of goes at it mm -hmm. allow them to you know this one didn't work what can i do again what can i do to improve that but, excellent yeah. so where where can listeners reach out to you if they want to ask you questions um my email address is i.renshaw at qt.edu.au um also via the constraint collective website um so we'd it's gone in a bit of a lapse. I've had too much work, proper work on at the moment. Mm -hmm. um, but we've, we've got a website where we've got links to articles. We've got um, interviews with coaches. We've got a blog that I need to get one out this week if I can, um, where we start talking about some of the concepts and, and ideas behind the, the whole approach. Yeah. Um, so through those, through those platforms, I guess, um, or through the books or through the materials. Excellent. Well, I really, really appreciate your time. Thank you for coming on, and I hope we can do That's this again nice. sometime. Yeah, yeah, I'm sure. With a bit less time constraint, it'd be good. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Thanks so much for listening to the Combat Learning Podcast. If you enjoyed this episode, remember to leave us a review on Apple Podcasts or Google Podcasts or your podcatcher of choice. It really helps us out. Finally, this episode, including the intro music, is produced by Micah Peacock. Thanks in advance. And I'll see you on the next episode.